The Man in Line with Andy Wint. Master Mai, good afternoon. Welcome to Man in Line on Manx Radio. We're open line this Friday lunchtime, so uh, the floor is yours by calling 66 13 68. I don't know whether you, uh, you saw the story about Evold in, in Peel not happening. It's uh, a big event. Lots of people used to go there, but uh, not this year. And also, uh, Onken uh, Commissioners, uh, members' expenses total £2,800 for a meeting attendance. Wow. And a change ahead for Ramsey Bakery. There are some plans submitted for the change of use at Ramsey Bakery. So, uh, of course, the... uh, Ramsey Baker were established in 1972 and called it quits 50 years later. Uh, But now if planning approval is given, the building is going to be converted from a bakery into industrial storage and office units. If you want to take a look at the planning application, go to manxradio.com, click on news, and it's on the story there. Uh, But also the TT scoreboard. What is going to happen to the TT scoreboard? It seems at the moment nothing because it is not a priority. Tim Johnson, MHK, the Enterprise Minister, says he can't commit to whether or not a replacement TT scoreboard will be in place in time for next year's TT races or not. The project's currently being put on hold until commercial funding is found for it. I just wonder if you're a TT... We talked a lot about the TT yesterday, about the past of the TT, but the future... The uh, Onkin MHK former member for motorsport, Rob Callister, uh, has some views on this. Yeah, I'm disappointed with the announcement back in 2018 when we took down the old scoreboard. It was very clear that a funding application would be submitted to Treasury. And I know a number of DFE ministers have submitted funding bids since 2018 because back then the old scoreboard had to come down for safety reasons. But it was done with the knowledge and the promise that the old scoreboard would be replaced with an up-to-date more technology facility for fans and locals to enjoy. Would it not reduce cost by reinstating a manual scoreboard with using the, the scouts on the island as well like we had before? I would welcome any type of scoreboard to be put back in place. But personally, I think given the technology that's needed in respect of the TT these days, I think combination of the old type of scoreboard and with new technology embedded into that scoreboard, I think that is the way to go forward. I think it's short-sightedness on Treasury's part not to really understand the fundamental part that the TT scoreboard plays within delivering this event, not just for our visitors, but also for our local And I hope the funding can be fined either through commercial sort of avenues or through local support and have this school board back in place for 2025 at the very latest. 2025 at the very latest. If you're a TT fan, I just wonder what you think about the future of the TT school board. Do we need it? Do we want it? Has it had its day? Do we need to reinvent it? Make it iconic again? And where, of course, is the money going to come? They're talking now about commercial sponsorship. Didn't anybody think of that when they knocked the other one down, when they took the other one away since, uh, since 2022? We could have had two years doing this. But any thoughts? Wilf's on now. Hi, Wilf. Uh, I um, uh, remember um, a few days ago I was talking about the lady gathering up leaves uh, plastic leaves up up at the uh, uh, our uh, at Albert Tower at the mobile phone mast, the make believe tree. Yes, yes. Well, they've been delivered to me. Two big bags full of plastic leaves delivered to me via the town hall, and Tim Cowan now is trying to sort out 
who would be responsible or whatever so they can sort it out. So where are but the they're... leaves at the moment? Are they at the town hall? or? Uh... I've got them. They're in my back of my car. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> But there we are. I was trying to think, what is this? Is this some Christmas tree that somebody give me or something? And then I found it out in the end. Well, okay. Think, but, uh, if anybody knows, but, uh, if anybody knows what to do with them, we'll, uh, go to Wilf. He'll tell you where to put the leaves. <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll tell him where to put them. Um, now the other thing was, you remember I'm always harping on about the state of my beach, right, in Ramsey. Yeah. Now, and then they want to leave it to build up or bird's nest, not whatever it is. I've just been told that for several days now, might have been a week, I don't know, maybe even today, there is tractors and trailers and men working on uh, Peel Beach to keep it immaculately clean. Now, the rub with this one is the wildlife headquarters is in Peel. So there's not going to be any birds nesting on Peel Beach. Or whatever, it's going to be kept it's kept lovely and clean. Now the other thing was um, Douglas Beach. I heard that there's lots of gravel being taken away, shifted, or whatever. Oh yeah, you there's know there's more. at you least two at least two machines. There's a digger and I think and a scraper there at the moment. But what are they doing with it? Well, they they're, they're, they're moving it around. I don't know where they're taking it. Oh, well, it's no they, they, they're total waste of money uh, if they're not taking it away. Moving it around won't do any good whatsoever. The next the next big blow-in show, yeah, put it back where it was. Well, it's right at the bottom of, um, of Broadway, where the old pier used to stick out there, so they're, they're shifting it around there. Right, <laughs> right. Well, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not really interested in Douglas. I just told them what to do about, it and they haven't done it. So that's up to them. Yeah, but that—that's um, where the dynamic of Douglas Beach changes. Because by the War Memorial, you're down twelve, fifteen feet to the level of the beach where it used to be, and it's just the yeah. other side of there where it starts then to build up, uh, up until you get to, up to Derby Castle where it slackens off again. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well. It's up to them. They let them carry on wasting the money. Now, the other thing I wanted to know was, when are you going to meet me down to look at my beach? Oh, I'll be up there next week, uh, Wilf. I'll be up there probably Monday or Tuesday. Ah, right. Okay. Will you you, you inform me or what? I'll inform you. You get the sandwiches and I'll be there, Wilf. Right. Okay. All right. (laughs) All right. Best best of luck with your leaves. Have a good weekend. All right, well, thank you. Cheers now. And David's on with us now. Hi, David. Hi, Andy. I just want a little talk, because you triggered my mind regarding getting out and about. I don't. Uh, I think that was what you, Manx Radio used to do now and again, to go to locations. Yeah. Uh, I'm involved with two charities where Uncle AFC and Uncle Pension Social Club. And uh, Uncle Pension Social Club have been collecting for the food bank for a little while, and then Last week, uh, Onkin AFC did the same thing for the from the, the little kids right up to the grown ups, and uh, everybody collected a load of food. We must have had about forty bags, maybe forty five bags of food, all sorts of things, nappies and stuff like that. But what what I was thinking about, Andy, and this is where you come in, why uh, why can't you do a program from the food bank? Well, the, the whole thing about man in line, you know, when we go out and about, I mean, I'm, we're more than happy to go anywhere. What we need is, you know, uh, about a dozen people, minimum of a dozen people in a place between uh, 12 and 1 live where we can talk about things. And that's really all we want. We want people uh, with opinions who've got views on the world as we see it and the Isle of Man and things in general. And we're more than happy to pop along like we do with the schools. And we've done in the past. We've been to to uh, to Queen's Pier and what have you. But uh, yeah, no, we're more than happy to get out and about. If you can find a dozen people and we can get them in a room, we'll we'll bring the microphones out. Yeah, what I was thinking of doing, Andy, is uh, I'll have to ask the food bank uh, organisation there. But I just want to tell you, I went down uh, yesterday with some stuff as well uh, to the food bank, and the guy said to me, uh, Bernard, his name was quickly, just and there was a lot of people there too. 
have you ever been round to have a look to see what we actually do? And he gave us a little talk. And I was uh, quite surprised on the peaks and troughs where uh, they, they need food Christmas time, coming up to Easter. And I just wondered whether uh, we could do a little program there because you could have the Food Bank as a charity. There are several other charities that um, uh, support the Food Bank. So you've got at least 12 people there already to say, well, what does your charity do? Yeah. What does uh, your charity do? And we all help each other out, you know what I mean? Uh, I'll tell you what's important, David. You know, since COVID... Lots of yeah. new people have come to the Isle of Man. I think a lot of people left the island after COVID because they'd had a gut full of, of the whole thing. But we've been, everybody knows there are lots of new people who've come to the Isle of Man since. And I think it's really important that we showcase the Isle of Man to new people who come along and don't understand it, don't understand how different it is to wherever they may have, have come from. So the more opinions we get and the more we can let each other know what we do, I think the better. Yes, I'm, I'm all for it, like, and, uh, you know, I'm not uh, wanting to say I'll be there myself, but we could get somebody from our charity to come along and talk as well and do something different and say, uh, and I forgot the guy who was the head of all, uh, like, the charities in the Isle of Man now. Uh, it's to do with breast cancer and stuff like that. Uh, he coordinates things, and... You could get a feeling from the charities on what actually we have to do in the Isle of Man, what we have to comply with uh, in, in uh, the law uh, under the AG's office. They uh, ro uh, look after the charities, make sure we're, we're not um, laundering money. You know, it's, it sounds funny to people when you, when you talk to them. You say, you've got to be registered a charity, you've got to do this, X, Y, and Z. And most of it's down to money laundering to make sure that the charities in the Isle of Man are not money laundering into something else. Mm. But I just wondered. Now, the, the final thing for me on the scoreboards, that I couldn't believe three times Treasury have turned it down. So what have they been doing for the last? When the scoreboards went down, wouldn't you thought they said scoreboards are going down and I'd love to find out who actually made the, the decision on well, that. Well, as you say, when when it went or when it was spirited away and, and sent off somewhere, I think it's maybe down at Balthane or bits of it here, there and everywhere, but yeah. you would have thought yeah. they'd say, we've got plan A and plan B. Plan A is the taxpayer pays for it. Plan B is we'll get somebody else to pay for it. It seems to have oh. only just occurred to them. Yeah, why, why can't we do a joint venture? They're all into this thing, so the uh, housing board, the uh, health service board. We could have had a TT board, couldn't we? And we could have invited um, Honda, BMW, Kawasaki, all these people. You would have got a million pounds in, in probably one hit. They would have said, well, what can we do? Not Dunlop anymore. Uh, maybe somebody else. Uh, uh, what's the uh, Italian one that does the tyres for the racing? Stuff like that. Yeah. They probably would have had to love the, uh, put a tower up. And can you imagine? I, I pass uh, Glen Country Road all the time. There's always people wandering about with English cars yep. and mo motorcyclists there taking their pictures on standing on the podium with the back of the grandstand looking and on. you'll guarantee from a week on Sunday Easter Sunday when the clocks go forward you'll find people there early morning that iconic iconic shot just after sunrise when Glen Crutchery yeah. Road is empty there's a gorgeous shot if you stand by the where the old over uh, the bridge went over the pedestrian bridge went over there's a great shot up there with an empty road it looks like nowhere else in the world it's fantastic yeah and that's what we've got. That's what we're known for, won't we? Cats, the TT, three legs, anything like that. Yeah. Where's our PR coming from? It's not yeah. the government. All right. All right. Have a good weekend. Be your boy. Cheers now. Uh, just a quick word from uh, the Alaman Victorian Society. Um, if you are planning to attend tonight's talk on the steam railway, uh, sadly, the steam railway talk isn't going ahead tonight because the uh, speaker has been uh, detained off the island, unfortunately. There's been a last-minute change of programme. So Peter Kelly's going to give a presentation called Wish You Were Here, an Edwardian postcard tour of the Isle of Man. It's in the Barbara Cotty Lecture Theatre at St Ninian School.
Central tonight. Eight o'clock. Use the Somerset Road entrance. I think I went in that earlier on this week. Non-members welcome. Two pounds charge. Members, of course, free. And uh, two pounds includes light refreshment. So it's uh, an Edwardian postcard tour of the Isle of Man tonight. Not the railway tour, which will be rescheduled in the future. The 150th anniversary of the line to Port Erin. Uh, Howard's on now. Hi, Howard. Hello, Wendy. Um, just listened to you when you started the programme um, and they're saying about the, um, the scoreboards. Now, this sounds very much, this is the cynic in me, uh, the horse tram uh, sequence with them. They're saying we put it off till next year, we put it off till 24, we yeah. put it off. And how many more other things is this government going to postpone until they're all kicked out? Uh, in the next election. I suppose the cynic in you then, Howard, I don't want to speak for you, but I will, the cynic in you will say they're hoping that people will forget about it in the end, and it'll be so such a high cost in the end, people will just throw up their arms and say, no, don't bother. Well, this is the first figure they throw out. You've never heard of 100,000, 10,000 or whatever. The first uh, syllable out of their mouth is it's going to cost a million pounds. That's the starting figure, regardless whether they want to book, uh, book it on the promenade or they want to build a, a mansion there. And uh, I see they're down there excavating, and uh, there was a large articulated truck pulled up at the bottom of Broadway on the walkway, and they were loading the stone into it. Now, I don't know where that was going to. Uh, I've just been along the promenade, and a wall certainly looks better on the beach side. And it's bound to stop the stone coming up because it's now got somewhere to hit instead of rolling straight up onto the prom. But they may be taking it away because there seems to be a mound of it there at the bottom of Broadway on the beach. And there's a fairly large excavator lifting it over the railings and they appear to be dropping into the back of this articulated trailer. But that aside, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the horse trams and the scoreboards, they all seem to be sitting in the same lock-tight system within the government will put it off till afterwards. Well, procrastination is the stealer of time, and that's what we're going to get from our lot that's in there at the present moment. They'll just keep putting it off, putting it off, <clears throat> and as you rightly say, it will price itself off the market. I can't remember, maybe you can refresh. When did the tower clock go that used to be at the back of the scoreboards? That was, I think that was the Dunlop Tower, wasn't it? It was, yes. A big Lord. clock on it. Yeah. No, uh, somebody, somebody will know. Yeah, uh, that disappeared. The scoreboards were replaced uh, with new steel. Um, and uh, they turned around and said, well, again, it was because of lack of maintenance. They used to be taken away each year or maintained in situ. But then it, it was just forgotten and... Uh, again, rust. Rust stops for nobody. And uh, this is what's happened. They were rusting away and became dangerous. But now we've got a worse problem. Rust, you can cure it. But a lazy government, you can't. And, uh, you know, this is what we've got at the moment. They're putting things off and putting them off until such times that people will be disgusted and just say, how oh, to hell with it. Hmm. Mm. Well, I mean, it just depends what what somebody thinks the what somebody thinks the TT scoreboard is worth. Let's just do a bit of maths here. How they they said it's a million pounds for the scoreboard. Yep. Yeah. Well, let's be realistic. Then it's going to be two million pounds if the government does it. If it exactly. la if if it lasts forty years. <laughs> That's fifty thousand pounds a year. We Between get roughly we get roughly fifty thousand TT visitors a year. That's one pound mm -hmm. per visitor per year for forty years. That's now, not bad. exactly. I mean, with that arithmetic, wouldn't that seem? Wouldn't you think that that would be possibly worth it? I don't know. Maybe that's just rough arithmetic, as to see what it would be worth if it's. Uh, and also the fact that did nobody think about commercial sponsorship when it first came down? They can't think beyond the end of their nose. They've got to look at the figures and they go immediately to Treasury. They they've got a Department of Enterprise there. Um, they've missed one word of that title, and I won't say what it is, but it begins with L. And it's, they just don't seem to want to think beyond their office. If they get off their backsides and go out and have a look around, 
without a clipboard, just make life look interesting and see what there is to be done. And and this is how the tourist board and everybody in the tourist industry used to work. Now they sit in and they build a model on a computer how it should work. And that doesn't work. We all know that. But just going back to your um, Albert Tower, uh, somebody was saying about the artificial trees up there. I don't know how many people notice, but on the top of the White Bridge, they pick your own fruit farm. If you look, when you're coming from the Liverpool Arms side, there's been a, an artificial tree there, an aerial, for, oh, I would say 20 years. It's, uh, it's just on the horizon, right on the top of the hill, as you're looking out over the um, the farm. And it's been there for years. It stands out like a sore thumb, but if, you, if you're not looking for it, it blends in. Mm. So that that's not a new thing with the but they should never have put it on the Albert Tower. That's an insult to royalty. Mm. All right. Okay. Okay. Have a okay. good weekend. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Howard. And Andrew's with us now. Hi, Andrew. Hi there. Good morning, Andy. Uh, good afternoon, Fast Am I. Uh, principally, just wanted to agree with Howard. And uh, the, when schemes are put forward that go to Tinwald for Tinwald approval. I don't, be- I don't believe, um, maybe other listeners uh, have some thoughts, but I don't believe that MHKs should vote for any proposal whatsoever where something is going to be replaced, in inverted commas, until there is budget allocation approved by Treasury so that the, the replacement can then be done without delay. Because that's what seems to happen. We're going to replace the horse tram tracks. Didn't happen. We're going to do this. The scoreboard isn't happening. So, Andrew... Because there's no money available. But But there should be money available when they come to decide, yes, we're going to replace it. So where's the blockage then? If the elected representatives say, this is what we want to do, and it doesn't... They don't. They don't, do they? Because it's not put in in such a form that, yes, we're going to uh, remove the scoreboard and we're going to replace it with this, and we've got Treasury consent that there is money available for this amount to do it, and we're going to do it within this time frame. That's the bit that's missing for when the members vote on it. I mean, do you think this is... um this is part of the disconnect between politics and the people, but the electorate, the voters. If if the if the electorate hear that something's going to happen and it doesn't happen, it it just detach, it Absolutely just detaches correct. you from from the but what's from the, the point. Yeah, it just makes people think. What is the point of voting for MHKs when they don't actually control what's going on? There's no point. The civil servants are there and they pass, they put words in the minister's mouth and the members go, oh, right, OK, yes, uh, yeah, OK. But they don't think it through. And even if they do think it through, they vote on it. But they, the civil servants don't take any notice, do they? Because, you know, it got de-scoped the trams or oh, now we've, we haven't got the money. It's like it's... Uh, um, I'm, I'm looking at now at... Uh, the visit this week and some ideas came to mind and I'll let you know now I've actually put in a couple of FOIs to the council for example yeah. uh, the uh, mayoress's missing chain and whatever happened on that yeah where is what was that the last insured what was the last insured value yeah and when and what amount did the council subsequently receive from the insurers what amount is the current mayor's chain, chain insured for and the current mayoress's chain insured for? And as a result of the council now having city status, will any changes be needed to any of the mayor or regalia? And what will be the cost of such changes? Because I'm pretty sure the ratepayers didn't vote for uh, costs to be incurred like this. It will and, be interesting. Uh, I just wonder, I mean, just flippantly, I just wonder how much it costs to change all the stationery. That's one thing for a start. Well, yes. I mean, did we? Did the ratepayers vote for a, a metal plaque to be done? And all the other uh, welcome to Douglas, like the one when you're coming down from Onken uh, past the old Summerland site, that's going to have to be changed as well. Yeah. 
I and again, believe the ratepayers voted for any of this. And again, I, I'm not being flippant about this, but I mean, do you feel any burgeoning sense of civic pride knowing that Douglas is a city? No. None whatsoever. None whatsoever. So what do you I mean, think? The, what do you think the councillors in Douglas City Council can do for it to be? For Douglas to be like a city, to represent itself like a like a city, rather than just having the title city. Well, why does it need to? Well, it is now, so we may may, may as well run with it. (laughs) Yes, but I mean, for what purpose? We're a city. Oh well, yeah, okay. How many other cities are there in the world? Well, what's the point? It's just, I don't see the point. I just don't see the point, and I just don't see how there's going to be any economic benefit for just calling yourself a city rather than a town or a borough. Right. Next time we get uh, a Douglas council, a councillor in, maybe they can ask exactly. the, to answer the question. Exactly. Okay. All right. Thanks, Don't Andrew. Thanks now. Cheers, Cheers now. now. Have a good weekend. Here's Byron with us now. Hi, Byron. Yeah, hi, Andy. Just a quick feedback on the TT4 uh, scoreboard thing. Yeah. We have these massive mobile digital screens you'll see at concerts all over the place in the summer. Surely something like that, I, I would virtually guarantee, will be far cheaper and far easier to operate for the TT scoreboard. I'm rather surprised nobody's thought of it in the past, but uh, it would need to be investigated. But uh, you see them everywhere at different concerts, don't you? Yeah. Anyway, well. that's just a, that's just from me, Andy, so wish everybody well with that. Bless you. Thanks for calling today. 27 minutes before one on Manx Radio. You know, every Monday and Friday we delve back into to the uh, 60 years of Manx Radio and look at things that have happened in the past and also bring you some voices. Today, it is a belter. Talking about tourism, talking about people who knew how to represent the Isle of Man, Managing Director of the Palace and Derby Castle Limited and the Palace Hotel and Casino, Sir Dudley Cunliffe Owen. Looking back to 1970, Sir Dudley Cunliffe Owen will be on Manx Radio after Man in Line finishes today. Ever thought your storage could be more smart, more spacious, more stylish? Discover chic and clever bedroom storage solutions at Lifestyle Furniture. Crafted with care and precision, our range of sliding door and hinged wardrobes is available in a wide choice of sizes and beautiful finishes, all with 0% finance, and we'll deliver and build them for you absolutely free. Find a smarter wardrobe at Lifestyle Furniture, Snugborough Trading Estate and you. Union Mills. Finance available subject to status. Terms and conditions apply. See in store for details. We interrupt this broadcast to inform all our listeners about the huge range of bathrooms and showers on display at Pace Setter. Yes, you all know that Pace Setter is known as the island's largest tile store, but I'm here to tell you that their bathroom displays are truly inspirational. Visit Pace Setter on Harris Terrace, where you'll discover a fabulous collection of stylish bathrooms. There's something to suit everyone, with design available. Pace set of bathrooms and showers to show off about. Do you know a scrap man? Cos I've got scrap to clear. Cars in car for press and lead, and I need cash for beer. What? You don't know a scrap man? Castains of Foxel is the one for you. Castains will take all scrap metal and is also licensed for dry cell and lead acid batteries. So don't delay. Ring 801 337 now. So now we know a scrap man and all our scrap's been cleared. Ring 801 337. Then have cash for beer called cost. Today and get yourself a beer. At Isle of Man Energy, we're excited to offer our customers the Alpha E-Tech Efficient Hybrid Gas Boiler and Heat Pump Combination. This state-of-the-art hybrid boiler causes minimal disruption to your existing heating system, making it simple to upgrade. Priced from just £65 a month and with six-year warranty as standard, which can be extended to 10 years, what are you waiting for? Register for a free consultation at islandmanenergy.im. It's the business end of the season in the NWCFL Premier Division and with just around one month remaining, FC Isle of Man remain on the charge to get as many points on the board as possible. The Ravens' latest test sees them host Ramsbottom United at the Bowl on Saturday night with the visitors on the hunt for their first victory since early February. Join me, Rob Pritchard and Tony Meppen for FC Isle of Man versus Ramsbottom United kicking off at 6pm this Saturday. Manx Radio will be providing full live match commentary on our DAB and AM1368 channels. Live coverage of FC Isle of Man on Manx Radio is supported by Selton. 
investing in our community. The Man in Line with Andy Wint. 24 minutes before one. Open line today on Man in Line. Paul's on now. Hi, Paul. Hello there. I thought I'd call about the TT scoreboard just to put a different viewpoint. Yeah. I mean, it, it seems to me the scoreboard is really only in use for four weeks of the year. And, and the remaining 11 months, particularly over the winter, the old scoreboard was always sad and desolate and covered in litter and was, was not really um, an elevating site or an encouraging site. So um, having a, a, a disused scoreboard standing there for months over the winter, I, I don't think it actually enhances the environment of Douglas at all. Um, so having a temporary scoreboard coming in for when it's actually needed seems to make a lot of sense. I, I reckon, you know, if there's a business case for a permanent scoreboard and they can actually show it's good value for money, well, fair enough. Um, but but if not, from from the viewpoint of um, the sort of the the non bike fan, um, having the scoreboard only there when it's actually needed is is quite a bonus. Uh, so what you'd have a temporary one then just for Grand Prix and for the TT uh, a big one because the thing with the old one it was it was massive and it was it was, it was iconic so you don't think there's any merit in having that something like that I'm not going to say there's no merit in it I'm I'm going to say that um, I from from kind of chatting to people last year I didn't get the impression that um the the visitors were devastated by the lack of uh, sort of kids running around with bits of metal um, and if you've got a modern digital scoreboard you can change your display um, so you can convey a lot of information with less physical space um, and you haven't and, and if you bring it in and just using it when you actually need it you haven't got it just sort of hanging around gathering litter and detritus for the rest of the year I mean the old you know I, I walk up and down that area and the old school board um, it, it didn't enhance the area let's put it kindly interesting okay all right thanks Paul good to hear from okay. you good to talk to you Andy all Thank right you. thanks for that Bye 21 now. minutes before one have a good weekend Michael's with us now hi Michael hi Andy um I have to agree with your previous caller, Paul. Um, I think before the, the virtual ink has dried on the metaphorical check, any new scoreboard we put up will be just outmoded. And, you know, with having just big screens, they, they can come up with whatever scoreboard they want um, and, and convey whatever information they want and move with the times and use the screens at other places or just hire them uh, when they need them. OK, I mean, you are aware some people will think that you're voicing sacrilege here, Michael. Well, absolutely, but, I mean, if they wanted to put the old thing back up as it was, then, I mean, it was about ten minutes after somebody had gone through somewhere, the, 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 the Cub Scout went and turned the... Uh, Turn the arrow to show them that they were, were oh no, that happened automatically, didn't it actually? Uh, the, the arrow, about five minutes after the uh, rider had gone through, uh, turned uh, round to the next place, Ramsey or yeah. the bungalow or wherever it was. Um, I, I just don't think they do, they're able to convey as much information. Uh, if somebody's following a particular rider or, or relative or whatever, they can actually look at it in real time and see where, out of all the sectors that they are on the course. Um, mm. And I just think to invest such a huge amount of money for something that, that in 10 minutes' time, you know, it, it, that they've come up with something new that would be better, uh, I just think it's... It's it's not a good way of using our resources. Okay, I mean, so do you think in in some ways then the old school war was quaint rather than functional? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, like I said, the, the lap times went up and who was winning, and that was about ten minutes after they passed or, or something like that. It, it's it, it was quaint and it was lovely that the, the scouts were there to do it, and uh, and it was a, a brilliant experience for them. But unless we actually go back and and do that again, which, like I say, doesn't convey the amount of information that probably a lot of the modern viewers would would prefer, um, I just 
don't think it's really uh, worth spending that amount of money on. OK, well, we appreciate that, Michael. Thanks for calling today. All right, no problem, Andy. Bye. All right, have a good weekend. 19 minutes before one. Let's hear what the Minister has to say. Tim Johnston. I'm not going to make a commitment to that. I understand Ms Callis's views. Obviously, he was, as I say, he was a member of the department and, and was very keen to see that replaced. And I, and I understand that. And I think I agree with him. It would be great to see that replaced. So uh, I'm not going to make that commitment, but certainly want to make a commitment to look at it again seriously and see what we can do. It's not a priority at the moment. As I say, it's a, it's a big cost. It's around a, it was thought to be around a million pounds a few years ago now. So I think, you know, with, with, with costs... Um, it will be more than that. So it's about priorities. Obviously, we've got the temporary ones in place. That they, they do give a lot of information. Clearly, they are only relevant to the people who are actually in the grandstand, any, generally anyway. And, and I think also the, the pit crews find the, the new screens really positive. So I'd certainly want to see something like that incorporated going forward into, an, into some sort of replacement of the, what was there traditionally. Like you say, there's a timeline in place, so we have to see what, what's reasonable. Tim Johnson, MHK, on the proposals for the new TT grandstand uh, for the scoreboard, um, a million pounds. <laughs> so a temporary one, a new one, public sponsorship, commercial sponsorship. Uh, what do you think about it? Uh, with people relying on food banks, says Paul on 530, and a supposed cost of living crisis, Rob Callister wants to waste a million pounds of our money on an antiquated waste of time. The TT scoreboard belongs in the past. It was exactly this type of narrow-minded stubbornness not to move with the times that resulted in the TT losing its world championship status. The scoreboards have gone. Accept it. Move to the future. The world of Paul. Thanks also to um, uh, Frank, who just said, in addition to Roy Moore's fascinating recollections of the Honda team at Nursery Hotel in 1959, a good friend of mine was staying in, uh, at the TT, staying near the Nursery Hotel. He noticed the Honda team and over a period of days made friends with one of the team, whose name I forget. During the week, Frank helped them with various technical queries and was eventually allowed to sit on one of the race bikes at a photo of the event that he cherished. Eventually, his new Japanese friend allowed him to have a little test ride in the car park. I think he'd been helping them with the brakes. Great. And um, Frank found motorcycles and racing recuperating uh, from being shot down three times. And he went to race at the Clubman's TT and then shared his knowledge with the various riders in the team. That's Frank Lobley, ex-RAF engineer and flight engineer on Stirlings and Halifax bombers in the war. Thanks for that. Good to hear from you. We had another call as well regarding that yesterday. And it was for a gentleman who was talking about the Sulby Glen. Hello there. Follow, a follow-up to your program yesterday when you were talking about uh, the Honda team, which reminds me about the, probably the first year they came over, a, group, a small group of them with a man, which I assume was their team leader who spoke English. They called into the pub at Solby Glen, and I happened to be in the hotel at the time having a little drink, and uh, as soon as they came in the door, immediately the landlord, I won't mention his name, which well known, he had been a prisoner of war and held by the Japs. So you can imagine his reaction. In a matter of seconds, they were all out in the street. No idea what was taking place. They were wearing their arms and speaking in a foreign language. Then after a short time, the manager, who did speak English, bundled them all back into a car and away they went. But they didn't get no drink. Thank you. When the man in line's not on air, call Manx Radio to leave your opinion for broadcast on 682 631. At Thrive Farms, we have a passion for growing and providing fresh local food for the Manx community. As a not-for-profit, community-run business, we need volunteers. There are many opportunities to learn how to grow, harvest and more. Exchange your time for food and community. See Facebook or visit thrivefarmsiom.com for details. Thrive Farms. Our community. Our soil. Our legacy. This audio has been kindly sponsored by Miller Chaps of Ramsey. Ah, that's a large magnolia you've got there, Tom. I know, Bert. It's grown and grown, just like my savings have with the Guernsey Bank Skipton International. Really? They offer attractive interest rates and are genuinely committed to providing great customer service. Right. You always get a real human being to talk to, too, not some automated voice. If you want your savings to grow faster, looked after by real people who care, switch to Skipton today. Call 01481 730 730 or visit Skipton International. International.com 
Skipton International is licensed to take deposits by the GFSC and is a participant in the Guernsey Banking Deposit Compensation Scheme. Details at www.dcs.gg. There's monkeys and meerkats, penguins galore. You can meet with a panda, owls, lemurs and more. The Carax Wildlife Park is open seven days a week. So book your tickets and experiences online now at caraxwildlifepark.im. Whether you like live music, theatre, film, or running around in circles pretending to be a superhero, you'll love Villa Gaiety. With Dragon's Castle Play Area, Broadway Cinema, Gaiety Theatre and the Villa Marina. Check out the upcoming events at villagaiety.com or call 600 treble 5. Villa Gaiety, the island's premier entertainment venue. In 1964, Manx Radio was born. Right the way through this momentous year, we are marking the nation station's 60th birthday. On Monday and Friday, the Man in Line closes with a revealing dip into the archives. On Wednesday's Man in Line, we revisit the architectural gems revealed over the years by Kelly's Eye. And Kelly's Eye will be on Gullah's Gargan at 5 on Sunday. And you can subscribe to all of our anniversary content online. Go to the podcast series, 60 Years Serving the Nation, at manxradio.com. Manx Radio at 60. Born to broadcast, happy to help. The Man in Line with Andy Wint. A note here from Sean on 423. The scoreboard, yes, needed repairs every year, but wasn't it the case that the clerk of the course put it in his risk assessment for the TT course that it was deemed to be dangerous to have scouts on the board and bikes passing at high speed, despite the DOI spending thousands of pounds on that catch fence two years before? Um, thank you, Sean, for that point. Was that the truth? Was at the clerk, of course, that uh, was this. Why this 11th hour dilemma concerning the scoreboard, says Kath on 728. It's appalling. It's quite obvious This is that this issue was put on the back burner by those who just aren't interested in the TT course. Ah, you think that, Kath, do you? They had plenty of time to replace the scoreboard. There is no excuse for this. Thanks also to WhatsApp uh, uh, 575 just said, for something that brings in most of the Isle of Man's tourist money, this should be a priority, just like the horse trams or the government just not bothered anymore. Thanks also to um, the Dunlop Tower uh, had at the top the Stanley Woods clock, says Pete. The, that was uh, that was it. Is that true? So when did the clock go, I wonder? And such a shame that E. Volden has been cancelled, says Alec, thanks to Peel Town Commissioners. Is this narrow-mindedness? I understand that the huge sponsor package was offered to the organisation, uh, was from a well-known brewer, uh, and because they wanted to bring a mobile bar, bar, they voted against letting the bar operate. Didn't know that, if that's true, but it's your opinion at the moment, Alec. One of the commissioners... Um, uh, the commissioners uh, objected, presumably. Uh, the e Vol- the reasons behind the cancellation of E-Volden were discussed at Peel Town Commissioners' latest meeting. Financial constraints and issues with sponsorship were among the challenges. Last night, Peel Town Commissioners met for the first time since the ruling by the Planning Committee to also refuse the plans for Marine Parade. The board unanimously agreed that it will be appealing the decision and they submitted a planning application in November last year which in principle would have featured a new cafe, Crown Green Bowling Club House and public toilets. Marine Parade uh, is zoned for tourism use in the Peel local plan. So... um, that isn't going... I just wonder what you think about that. It was confirmed also at the meeting, Eve Alden's not going ahead. The big fire festival isn't going ahead due to financial constraints. Last month, the commissioners agreed to give the organisers £6,000, which the clerk confirmed is in line with the amount given to the carnival. The local authority said the organisers crowdfunded and sought sponsorship of the event to make up the shortfall. An email sent to the local authority attached as part of the minutes says the sponsorship package was obtained and would have been a welcome attraction to the town. It also says the commissioners didn't support the sponsorship offer which was put forward and this is one of the reasons that the event isn't going forward. We'll find out more obviously as this time uh, goes on. However, the local authority says it's always supported Evolden. 
We'll find out. Incidentally, as well, there was a planning application which was discussed. It was Dan Dara's proposal for 92 houses off Balotess and Meadow. The commissioners agreed to ask planning for a deferment to give them time to speak to developers about their concerns with the plan. Uh, the board members said particular concerns were planning gain and insufficient infrastructure to support the development as well as the lack of public transport routes for what is happening in... Um, in Peel. Interesting. I wonder what your thoughts are on E. Valdin. I just want to bring you what the uh, the um, Enterprise Minister, Tim Johnson, says about the future of the TT Grandstand. Much has been talked about this. There's constant maintenance, ongoing maintenance and improvement in that area. There's been a lot of investment in the Grandstand. There's no immediate challenge. Still a relatively modern building. It still achieves what we need to achieve. And I say there has been further investment. So no major plans at this stage. It will be an ongoing process of investment. Quite happy now. We've got a new, a new member in place and we're looking to do some work on that. Part of a broader package of plans and exciting plans we have for the the TT moving it forward. So certainly happy to look at it again as part of that because we recognise the heritage and, and this and the symbolism of that. Absolutely want to see something happening but again I don't want to put sort of time scales on it at this stage. A huge amount of history and, and heritage to the event. We also have to remember that it's an ongoing challenge investment in safety for example and, we, and we've seen huge increases in insurance. So the work we're doing to build that global audience for the TT and get that new supporter coming to the island, that bucket list to come to the island to see the TT that's our priority because that's where we'll make the TT sustainable. What do you think about this? What do you think about the future possible? Do you think we should be rethinking what the TT scoreboard is going to look like? Tim Johnson also talking about the grandstand and how much of a life that's got left. If if it is, if the TT is to uh, thrive and to move forward and as Tim Johnson said, to get those bucket list tourists in, uh, what do we have to do, do you think? I think it would make sense, says Mark, to replace the TT scoreboard with a temporary display, uh, similar to the one at the bottom of Paul Rose Bridge, which is used for advertising, says Mark. It's bright, that is, isn't it? My word, in the middle of the night, that's bright. Could you ask the climate change transformation team um, what date is penciled in for the very last TT? I'm guessing it doesn't fit with a net zero policy. A TT scoreboard isn't needed in 2024. It's a museum piece, says WhatsApper 805. Most people look at the results on their phone. Surely that's the way forward. So what are your thoughts on this? Text, email, call and WhatsApp. We're back with an open line on Monday. And if uh, out of hours you want to get in touch, as our caller did regarding the Solby Glen and the Honda team... The answer phone is 682631. Thanks for that call. And out of hours, email maninline at manxradio.com. Next Thursday, just prior to Good Friday, it's a constituency man in line, Douglas Central MHK's Chris Thomas and Ann Corlett will be live. But uh, open line on Monday. Uh, thanks to Howie Kane on the phones today. Have a great weekend. W. I-N-T 60 years serving you as the nation station This is Manx Radio In 1970, the Manx tourism industry was starting to struggle The tried and tested offering of decades was beginning to wilt in the face of the sunshine of the Costa Brava Reinvention was needed and that was recognised by Sir Dudley Cunliffe Owen Managing Director of the Palace and Derby Castle Limited and the Palace Hotel and Casino. As far as the general run of the tourist industry uh, was in 1970, I would describe it that we had a traditional, usual, uh, rather dull season. And quite frankly, uh, when I look to 1971, uh, I'm extremely worried I think we'll have another dull traditional season. I think we are going to be hit hard by the package deals which go to the continent where they have sunshine. The package deal is getting cheaper and cheaper and to physically arrive in the island is getting more and more expensive. And I am of the opinion that the time has come uh, when something really drastic has got to be done in the island to attract the tourists. We've had the tourist report and nothing seems to be happening. 
And as far as I'm concerned, I think that 1971 will be a worse season than 1970 unless something is done and done fast. Would you have any particular thoughts of what the immediate action should be? I am very keen on making some price differences in the island that will attract people. I should like to see uh, drink and cigarettes certainly cheaper. I think we should examine the possibilities of possibly lowering the price of just beer, but something's got to be done to make the island different this season from what it was last season. We seem to have been in the same old tourist rut for years. It's a highly competitive business, and we have got to keep up with the times. And people year after year are not going to be satisfied with either the Palace Ballroom or the Villa Marina, uh, when literally dozens of brand new modern conference halls are being built not only in England, but all over Europe. In 1971, on the site of the old Derby Castle, what was claimed to be the largest indoor leisure complex in Europe was opened. Its name was Summerland. Part of island life for 60 years. This is your Manx Radio.